Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, Save Months of Labor by Automating for NERC SIP 7 Version 5 Requirement 1. I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Coordinator at Tripwire, and I'm very excited to be part of this presentation today. Before we start, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it is turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's webcast is presented using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement on your console, you can try refreshing your browser. If you do have any kind of technical difficulty, please click on the Help widget. It's the question mark icon on your console, and it covers most common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question, and we will, time permitting, have a Q&A session at the end. During the presentation, Itself, we will have three polls, and we'd uh, really appreciate your feedback during those polls, so you will see those pop up. And lastly, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and a link to the slides. And you may also earn a CPE credit for attending today, so just respond to that email. Now let's get on with the presentation. Our speakers today are Robert Held, Senior Systems Engineer at Tripwire, and a customer of ours, Great River Energy. Our, their information security manager, Mark Child. So today's agenda, first we're going to go over the requirement, then review the whitelisting profiler, and then Mark Child from Green River Energy will come in with some user details to share with us. So I'd like to thank both of our presenters, Robert and Mark, for being here today. So now without further delay, I'll turn it over to Robert Held. Take it away, Robert. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Uh, we just wanted to take a little bit of time to go over one of uh, what's kind of been, been one of the most challenging uh, aspects of the NERC SIP compliance program for a lot of our customers and talk about a unique solution that, that we've developed around that. So uh, just to give a little background, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, we've got, we have a, a lot of history in, in the compliance space. A couple of years ago, we sat down to look at where do the tools that Tripwire provides, uh, where do our offerings fit into those NERC SIP requirements? And what you're seeing here is really a matrix uh, of that work. Now, at the time it was SIP version 3. This one's more geared towards SIP version 5. Uh, and certainly we have uh, a lot more background into the specifics of, of how we help you accomplish these specific goals. So we, we can certainly provide you with that as well. Now, the one I want to focus on today is, is specifically around SIP 007, uh, requirement 1 for ports and services. Uh, as you, as you uh, certainly know, uh, you know, the requirement really wants us to go out, document all of the list and ports on our network, so provide some justification for why particular things exist out in the environment. Um, now, there, there's a oh, and uh, sorry, I already jumped on to one of our uh, one of our quick questions there. So if you could just real quick take a look through that, and, and we're going to just solicit a little bit of feedback, and we'll present that to you here in just a second uh, once people have a chance to, to kind of ring in. But you know, as I mentioned, you know, we're, we're a security company at heart, uh, so we're, we're very security focused. We, we also do a lot of compliance work, in, especially in that ERCSIP area. Uh, so we just want to get a little feedback from everyone uh, regarding that. Um, let see, Kate, did that, uh, I'm not sure that, uh, I got the button for that. Did that come up on your side? I'm having a little okay. problem with okay. myself. Why don't you continue on, Robert, and we'll figure this sure, out sure. and get that pull out in a bit. All right, thanks. So, oh, looks like we did get uh, some responses back there. Hopefully those are up on the screen. So, um, yeah, certainly take note of that, and, and uh, we'll include that in some information at uh, uh, the conclusion as well. So as I mentioned, um, you know the, the burden of evidence around NERCSIP and especially around uh, the requirements for for list and ports. Uh, you know the the guidelines do give you some examples of how you can present that information, and it's really the first one uh, that I have on the list here that we want to focus on today: being able to provide those justifications and documentation for why do we need these things in our environment. 
know, why are we running particular ports on particular systems, or why are particular services running? Um, and continue on here. So, the, and the reason why this is so important is, you know, we we've been looking over the last few years to, you know, see where our customers are spending their time, where are they having particular challenges around compliance requirements. And one of the things we came upon was, was uh, and certainly this is around version 3, uh, but it was really 007 is where a lot of the audit findings were coming up. Uh, and uh, luckily that's something that's right in, in Tripwire's wheelhouse, and, and we've uh, had a very uh, diligent effort to address a lot of those things in 007. Uh, now, you know, with the SIP version 5 coming along. Uh, personally, I think this is going to change a lot. I think uh, requirement 10 is going to float to the top of this list pretty quickly uh, because some of the requirements that are that are coming up in there. Uh, Mark, did you have any uh, any comments specifically around SIP 10 or, or maybe something that you guys have been uh, looking towards for addressing that? Well, only that, uh, and, and yes, thanks for asking me uh, to chime in on this one, because SIP 10 is, you know, as everybody knows, it's a, it's a new standard, a new requirement, set of requirements um, based on language from the previous uh, version 3 standards. And at this time, we just don't know if, if the edits to those, uh, to those requirements uh, made it easier or harder for entities to comply with the ports and services requirement. Uh, I guess time will tell as we get into uh, compliance season next year as to how difficult it actually will be for entities to, to demonstrate compliance to the requirements in SIP 10. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, moving along, um, you know, the typical compliance process that we see at customers a lot, um, you know, when they're, when they're first getting started with NERC SIP or, or if maybe their, their program hasn't matured to that level, uh, is really periodic audits of uh, what's out in their environment, things like going through systems, printing out net stats, uh, you know, network scans, dumping everything out to, to the land, having their people go through it, do documentation matching, try to figure out what all this information means. And, and really the challenges around that are, are you, you end up with a, with a process uh, that's, that's not repeatable. Uh, it's a lot of manual effort. Um, you know, the data is not very good. It has a lot of, um, you know, uh, human eyes on it, a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of stare and compare. Uh, and frankly, you know, I, I've spoken with a lot of customers specifically about this, and, you know, oftentimes I ask them, you know, what was your confidence level with the evidence you were providing the last time you went into an audit? And, and usually I get a chuckle at that, and, and uh, you know, people say not very good. We, you know, we weren't sure how well that was going to uh, pass muster with the auditors. And, um, you know, that, that really helps us drive the solutions that we have because, you know, what, um, what we've put together is, is really around taking those actual values off of your systems, matching them up programmatically with your documentation, and presenting that audit evidence forward. So what you're seeing on the screen here is an example of one of our auditor reports. So this is the kind of report you would hand to the auditor. Hey, this is why these things are in our environment. Um, and so a couple key points I want to I want to point out here. You know, this is an example of a typical Linux server. Uh, you know, it's running a few ports, 22, 98, 98, and uh, ADP 512. But what's really most important are those last three fields, the description, the justification, and the documentation. Those are all user-provided data. Now, uh, I have three fields of data in my sample here that's perfectly customizable to your environment. Uh, if you need 10 fields of data, two fields of data. Uh, so you can take the information that you already have uh, and incorporate that into our into our whitelisting process. Uh, and another important thing to note is this is all role based. So, for instance, in my in my Tripwire Enterprise Console, I have an asset grouping for all of my Linux assets. And I've said as long as you're in that Linux group, you're allowed to run TCP 22 uh, for the SSHD process. And here's why. So, being able to, um, you know, as I'm onboarding assets, as long as I put them into their proper roles. Um, then that documentation automatically falls into place. Uh, now we do have also support a lot of things, you know, like port ranges and uh, for ephemeral ports and things of that nature. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, Triple Enterprise is an agent-based product uh, for the most part for traditional operating systems. Uh, for systems where perhaps we can't run an agent or we can't query the system and get enough information about its port usage, uh, we can also rely on external network scans. Uh, to pull that information back in. So if you know if we want to do NMAP scans, we want to use uh, Tripwire's IP360 offering uh, to go out and, and discover the assets on the network and 
and uh, pull back the port information from those, uh, that's certainly something that you can roll back through the same uh, whitelisting methodology that we have here. Um, so again, this is an example of an of an audit report. Um, we also have uh, a good deal of, of reports around um, you know reporting exceptions and things. So we also you know we, this all started with with ports and being able to document that usage in the environment. We took a step back and and try to discover what other aspects of NERC SIP compliance can we apply the same whitelisting methodology to. Um, so certainly things like services, users, groups, um, you can provide these same things to. And, and just as an example, um, this is an example of, of a typical user's report. So to where I've said, um, you know, because we also have requirements in the NERC SIP space to do password management. How do I show the auditors that I'm effectively updating and managing passwords in the environment? So here I've said this Linux server is allowed to have a root user ID as well as a Robert user ID locally. As long as root's password is not over 365 days old, and as long as Robert's password is not only over 90 days old. If they are, flag that as, a, as an exception that needs to be addressed. There's also a lot of operational reporting around here to you know, warn me when these things get to 80% and things of that nature. So to help manage that workload in your environment. Um, so just another another uh, quick survey here, and, and uh, I promise you there's not like a timeshare pitch in, involved at the end of this or anything. So um, just take a quick second and, uh, and click a button there, and, and uh, we'll give it just a couple of couple more seconds. And that's a that's a pretty short question. So um, go ahead and submit that. Are we having a, a technical challenge here again? Okay, well, we will uh, we'll move on to that. Okay, and this, this is an example of one of our compliance dashboards. So, you know, especially with Requirement 10 coming, uh, things like post-change checkout and making sure that your changes didn't impact the security baselines that you have on your, on your assets, uh, being able to simplify that down to a dashboard to say, are all of my controls in place? Did this change that I made to my system impact the security posture of these devices and take me out of dark SIP compliance? Um, so rather than doing manual checkout and screenshots and spreadsheets and things of that nature, uh, they really boil down to, to a matter of pass-fail uh, type tests in, in Triple Enterprise to manage those baselines. Um, and you know, once once uh, you, know, you get your program to where things are in compliance, it's very easy to keep them in compliance. And, and that's kind of the next uh, you know, point I wanted to bring up is what we typically see, and, and this is not just in NERC SIP, but in a lot of uh, other areas of, of compliance, uh, is manual efforts tend to lead to some of a roller coaster of compliance. You know, maybe we go back and we take a look through all our, our NERC SIP efforts once a quarter, once uh, you know, prior or just prior to an audit. What we find is is we end up doing a big remediation effort to bring us back into compliance uh, when we do those things because of those manual efforts and, and the time it, uh, it it takes to do those things. So really, the idea is to get down to where you know we've got everything passing, everything's green, everything's good. Let's keep it that way. And how, and the only way we can do that is if we're if we're being automatically notified of those exceptions in the environment. Uh, if it's something we have to go out and do manually. Uh, oftentimes that work's going to fall by the wayside and, and uh, things are going to get fairly out of compliance by the time we uh, we get around to readdressing those. Uh, again, I think this is the last uh, uh, quick survey question we have on here. Um, security awareness training, so certainly an, an NERC SIP requirement. Uh, but it, it also, uh, taking a note, you know, outside of NERC SIP, uh, are you also performing this training for uh, maybe people on the corporate side of the house or uh, maybe managing that program uniformly across the uh, across the company there. So, okay. So yeah, that's uh, outstanding. That's uh, a very high percentage, which I, I would certainly would have hoped for. And and uh, okay. So again, just to uh, and and I think uh, uh, we're probably coming to the end of my slides here, and we'll turn it over to Mark. But you know, just to, to talk a little bit about uh, you know that continuous compliance. You know, it, the the whole idea of let's get ready for the audit is is something that that we you know really trying to get away from. You know, it's it's having that 
that evidence ready at a moment's notice. Uh, it runs every day. It's something that I can just go to the, to the Tripwire console and pull up, maybe print out a report, uh, and be able to hand that off to the auditor whenever it's asked for. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and certainly, you know, we're, uh, we have a lot of coverage for NERC SIP. Uh, across your enterprise, you know, we also do a, a great deal of work in things like PCI, HIPAA, SOX, uh, NIST, uh, you know, uh, more standards than, uh, than most people can keep track of. So, um, certainly, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mark at this point, but certainly use the Q&A function down at the bottom, and if you have some questions that come up, we'll be addressing those after um, after Mark tells us a little bit about how Great River Energy is, uh, is using the solution in their environment. All right, uh, thanks, and uh, if you want to take it away, Mark. Yeah, and thanks, Robert. I appreciate the intro, and uh, I want to thank the, the folks at Tripwire for inviting me to present today. Uh, GRE has been a happy customer of Tripwire for several years now, and we recently met uh, at a conference uh, where we were each presenting our stories of uh, use of Tripwire for NERC compliance and decided to uh, kind of get together and, and produce this, uh, this joint uh, presentation. Hopefully you find it valuable. Um, I see there's a lot of different sizes and shapes of entities on the, on the call today. Uh, a little bit about Great River Energy. Uh, we are a, a G&T uh, cooperative based in Minnesota. Uh, we serve uh, distribution members uh, about two-thirds of the state of, of Minnesota here, and, uh, and we're considered a, a large GNT, which is kind of like being the tallest midget in the room. But we, uh, we are uh, very challenged, like most people, uh, with complying to NERC SIP um, all the way back to version 1. And uh, what follows is a little bit of our story here as to how we've uh, implemented Tripwire over time and kind of what our current state is, and if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about uh, where we're in, intending to take the tool into the future. Uh, so moving on, uh, I want to start with, uh, uh, again, uh, like I mentioned, a, a little bit of our history, a little bit, a bit of our use cases. We, we elected a long time ago to use Tripwire um, to serve both our corporate environment as well as our NERC uh, CIP environment. And we're doing so with, uh, with all of the different flavors of alerting and monitoring that the, the tool is capable of uh, in the form of file integrity monitoring, operating system critical files monitoring, um, and most recently the whitelisting option uh, that Robert mentioned a few minutes ago. And I'll dive into a little bit of uh, how specifically we do that and what that looks like. So just as background, uh, Great River Energy, as I mentioned, has been a customer for a few years. Uh, but it started actually with an audit issue from our financial auditors back in 2007. Um, we're a, uh, I mentioned a large GNT, but we're a small company. We have uh, developers in our IT department that had access to production environments, and this is specifically for our um, financials application, our, our human resources application, Lawson. And it's been a perennial finding that uh, the same people that do the development of code changes uh, put it into production, and you know auditors everywhere consider that a risk. Uh, we trust our people, we hire good people, but that's you know I'm a security guy, I kind of get it. Um, developers, you got to keep an eye on, and uh, so it was a, an issue dating back to 2007, and the auditors at that time started to suggest that perhaps a file integrity monitoring solution would help mitigate the risk. In 2009, uh, one of our board members uh, from a small cooperative somewhere in Minnesota. Um, actually brought uh, into the, the board uh, room um, a, a heap of criticism on that audit finding that, well, even at our small cooperative, we're using Tripwire, and uh, Tripwire specifically to meet this objective and to this, uh, for this mitigated control. And uh, we were a little ashamed, so in 2010, we went down the path. We purchased a starter pack of Tripwire, and we put it in place just for one financial system. And then in 2011, we got a a violation. Um, R2 is the ports and services requirement in SIP version 3, and uh, we turned to uh, Tripwire and jumped in both feet in 2011. So what does it look like? Um, we've seen a couple of, of screenshots from Robert. Uh, this is our live system, a screenshot of, on the corporate side, that, uh, that HR system that I mentioned. Um, we have, uh, it's running on Solaris. We're using the canned out-of-the-box rules. Uh, we're looking at installed packages. Uh, we're tripping, so to speak, whenever something changes for critical binaries or library files. And we also have some file integrity rules that we developed uh, for the source code directory running on those servers. 
this is hard to read, I appreciate, but uh, this is what it looks like in, within the system. Uh, these are the rules that we established for the file system. These are where uh, the important stuff is on the server and the things that we want to watch out for. Uh, we were lucky in that our vendor um, spoke Tripwire. They understood um, how Tripwire works, what the, what the rules are, where start points and stop points are, and, and what sorts of uh, criteria you should be looking out for. Uh, we were lucky, and we were just getting started with Tripwire um, and having that resource. I will say that not all software vendors um, will be so helpful in, in providing you uh, a canned set of watch for these sorts of things. Um, you'll have to rely on uh, internal subject matter expertise or Tripwire uh, professional services um, if you don't have that expertise to develop custom rules for your applications. Uh, the previous was an example of a file integrity monitoring rule, set of rules. This is an example of what's called a command output capture rule. Um, one of the most, um, probably the most powerful feature of, of Tripwire is the ability to take anything that you can type in a command line, uh, run it, uh, record the results, run it again later, and then compare the two. Uh, that is fundamentally how it does its thing. Um, and that's what a command output capture rule. So in, in your command line here on the screen, package info is a, is a Unix command, uh, returns a set of information. This is a simple one. Uh, if you can type it into a, a C prompt on a Windows server, you can put it in here. Uh, they can be as simple as package info, uh, the, the scripts that run the whitelisting thing that I'll get into in a minute, uh, can be pages and pages of, of scripts. But as long as you can, again, type it in a command line, Tripwire can do it for you. And lastly, the third type of check that we're doing is operating system. Uh, these are rules that are uh, nicely packaged up for you. You can download them if you're a Tripwire customer. And these are the rules that we downloaded for operating system Linux. And uh, if you're a Linux person, you recognize these files and directories. Um, the host file, as you imagine, that's exactly what it is. And that is an important thing to watch. So is Etsy group. And you're looking for the contents of that file, uh, the permissions, if those change. Uh, what we're not doing right now is much on the waiting. Uh, you'll see the number in the middle of the screen there of 10,000. And another, uh, looking ahead here, one of the things that Great River Energy is going to look into doing is playing around with those numbers. The idea being that uh, you can set a waiting value of 10,000 and take action uh, based on that value. Anything less than 10,000, you do a separate set of things. Uh, anything greater than 10,000, you do a different set of things. And I'll get into that in a second. So moving from corporate into the NERC world, um, we are uh, a NERC registered entity. We have critical assets and critical cyber assets. Um, those critical cyber assets uh, categorically are listed on the screen here. Uh, we've got commodity operating systems like Windows and Linux, uh, also a lot of Cisco gear. We've got ASA firewalls. We've got Cisco routers and switches. Uh, and then we've got some other appliance-based things that are in the, uh, our ESPs. Uh, ESX servers for VMware, we've got Cisco ACS, we've got NetApps, and uh, some other things that aren't listed on the screen here. Um, but I will say that of all, all of the assets that are on our declared list for CCAs, uh, Tripwire is monitoring all of them successfully. <clears throat> so looking into the, the NERC rule set a little bit, um, one of the challenges with version 3, or I should say the, the whole NERC SIP regi regime prior to version 5, is that it, you know, a, a baseline configuration monitoring was somewhat implied, um, but it wasn't as nicely spelled out as it is under SIP 10. Um, under SIP 10, they're very helpful in giving you five specific things that you should consider as your baseline. Uh, things like the operating system, uh, custom software, security patches, etc. Um, back in the day, we decided that we, we downloaded the policies from the, the Tripwire website, and this is what, what showed up. All of these things uh, were developed by the kind folks at Tripwire as this is a baseline. And as you can see, it gets pretty drastic. Result and set of policy, uh, server roles, uh, local administrator group, logins, et cetera, et cetera. You can read the list here. Uh, but this is a big um, configuration for configuration monitoring. Uh, you could potentially get a lot of uh, a lot of noise out of this, and one of the things that we're going to be doing in the future is tuning this down uh, to make it more compliant with version 5 and, uh, and take different actions 
for lower criticality things than we would for higher criticality things. Again, using that weighting that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so we've set up the rules. We set up the file integrity monitoring, the operating system monitoring, and the command output capture rules. And when things are detected, we do one of two things here at GRE. We send an email to our network operations center, um, and um, or uh, we can send an SNMP alert to our ticketing system through SolarWinds Orion in our specific case. Um, the rules are as granular as you'd expect for this sort of a, a trip or an alert. You can do one thing. For a different set, you can do a different thing. And uh, we've definitely taken advantage of that here at GRE. How those alerts are presented uh, to our network operating personnel um, are in the form of dashboards. And we'll kind of take an aside here on this. We, uh, when we first developed Tripwire, uh, we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to dashboards. It was one of those things that, you know, most of the security tools nowadays have them and they're greater or lesser usefulness. Um, they're eye candy for the executives in a lot of cases. And uh, we didn't spend a lot of time on them. Uh, we kind of dove in and, and did the mechanics and the plumbing and spent our, our efforts uh, doing that and getting it working. And recently, and because of that violation we had a couple of years ago, we brought in Tripwire to do a professional services engagement, put in the whitelisting, and the very first thing that the Tripwire um, technician did is said, um, before we get into this, we're going to spend some time doing dashboards. And he set up, and he spent probably a full day working with us to get dashboards set up and our requirements. And, and I have to say that as a result of that, um, our visualization into our environment went up a hundredfold. Um, pick a number, a, a great deal. This has become probably the most um, important feature of the tool for us at this point as far as a productivity gain. So this is kind of what they look like. I'm going to dive into one of them, changes by node. <clears throat> and that is that alert on the left. And you can see that um, it's interactive. It's not just a pretty report. Um, it's hard to read, but the, the circled thing is that for NERC Linux group of assets, uh, there were some number, and I can't even read it, um, of actual changes that were done in the last 24 hours. And our operations personnel will click on that link, and it will bring up a, a screen uh, showing exactly what servers and ex exactly what elements uh, were detected over the last 24 hours. You know, perhaps it was a set of patch, uh, patches that were applied, and in this case it was uh, some unauthorized network port activity that was detected. So two clicks, they're into the actual details. So move on from alerts um, into the whitelists. And I know Robert uh, covered some of this, and maybe some of the screens will look the same. Um, but this is what they actually look like in real life. And as you can see here, they, they, they manifest themselves as flat files on the Tripwire server. Uh, you've got your groups, you've got local users, port services, what you'd expect. Um, they do provide uh, a great deal of uh, capability um, as far as monitoring your environment. And uh, we'll look into what those look like. This is what one looks like. This is real life, um, probably several iterations ago. Um, it's hard to read, but the columns uh, going across are on the left-hand side. What are the groups of servers? Um, it's, it's handy to group your assets into uh, sort, of like, sort of like version 5, group them into groups, and that way you can apply one rule set across all of them. Uh, the name of the service, the description of the service, uh, your change control number that authorized that service to be in existence, and some other really good information. Ports, on the next slide, look very much the same. This is where we spent the money and got the value. Um, here are the port ranges for Windows in this case. Uh, you can see ranges listed. You can see static ports listed, 445 for TCP. Um, you've got a justification value that you can put in there. Why is What is the business reason for this port and service? And a documentation uh, column for uh, references to a, a internet site or your vendor's papers or anything you want to put in there. And what it looks like is a report that you can produce. And this is kind of where my story started here in that with our recent, most recent audit, um, since our violation in 2011, we've been audited again. This was last year. And one of the requests for information from our region, which is MRO, was please provide a list of all approved ports and services for your cyber assets. And for us, it was log on to Tripwire and click one report button, and this is what showed up. This was presented to the auditors, and we never had a single discussion on ports and services after that. It was literally that quick for us. 
So what this shows is this is real life. This is not uh, just uh, reprinting the, the whitelist file. This is the real server. So for the given server on this screen here, um, port number 10080 is running java.exe, and you can see our documentation and our justification. And if that was a port range, um, it would show only what the current port is at this point in time within that range. Very powerful. <clears throat> Moving right along, um, getting kind of the end here. This is a screenshot of the Tripwire website, and uh, it shows what, what is available for NERC um, uh, templates, if you will, that you can download and apply to your assets. I'll start on the right, on the, the far right, these are the systems that, uh, and I'm kind of getting into Robert's area here, but uh, these are the systems that they support uh, just in general. And uh, the one on the left is the, the, the specific types of, of operating systems that they have uh, rule sets for, for NERC specifically. Uh, so policies and trips and, and configuration monitoring and all those sorts of things uh, for these platforms are available to you, and probably even more since I made this slide. And I think I'm running out of steam. Uh, we're getting ready, I think, for the Q&A section. Uh, Robert, was there anything you'd like to add in at this point or uh, or correct me if I said something wrong? <laughs> uh, no, not, not correct, certainly, but uh, just to add to your last slide there, we also have NERC 5 specific content that's uh, that's been released since your slide was made. Uh, so that's available out on the Tripwire Customer Center. Uh, certainly for platforms that uh, perhaps you know, are maybe a little more non-standard than traditional operating systems and things, we can also create uh, policies that are that are very specific to those devices based on the information we're able to collect from them. Uh, so no, excellent, and, and uh, I think we can get uh, probably have a little time for for at least a, a couple of questions out of here. So we had a question about um, about uh, vulnerability management of those ports that are discovered, and, and specifically around um, the Tripwire a couple of years ago. Um, acquired a company called Encircle, and one of the reasons that we acquired Encircle is they were a leader in the vulnerability management space. And so part of our what we refer to as our NERC solution suite includes IP360, uh, which goes out and not only inventories the network and, and those ports and things that are out there, but then it also compares those against known vulnerabilities out in the industry. So our, our uh, system has a little over 100,000 vulnerabilities in it today, and uh, you know, some of those are, are industry standard vulnerabilities that the different bodies have published. Some of those are based on the research that we've done. Um, but certainly the, uh, uh, there's a lot of tie-ins between Tripwire Enterprise and IP360. And, and certainly if, if you'd like more information about that, uh, contact us at the end here and we can get you some of that. Uh, we also had a question regarding um, the services uh, whitelisting and specifically around uh, the different startup types such as manual, automatic, uh, disabled, etc. Uh, currently the solution um, considers anything that's not disabled uh, to be an active service. So if it's set to manual, um, if it's set to automatic, uh, it will show up in that report. Uh, we have had some requests to provide a little more granularity there so that you can Say well, as long as this is set to manual and not automatic, it's okay. Um, the good news there is I, I'm the original author of our whitelisting solution. Uh, over the last year, we've uh, it's grown substantially, and we've brought in some more resources to help manage that, to formalize some of our processes around um, code management things. Uh, and another one of those is prioritizing those enhancement requests. So uh, I know certainly that one's uh, one of the ones on there, and that's something that's that's being worked on. And I think you'll see that at an upcoming version of the whitelisting. Uh, well, taking a look, I think there was a, a question for you here, Mark. Um, if um, uh, it says uh, for Mark, uh, he uses a tripwire out of the box to consider the baseline of the system. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, as far as the uh, the baseline requirements? Yeah, yeah, Matthew, that was a good question. Um, he, uh, the, the question specifically was that, uh, or in response to my statement uh, that we had kind of used Tripwire out of the box and all of the different rule sets that were available for that uh, that commodity operating system, I, I don't remember if it was a Windows or a Linux uh, example, um, but we, uh, we we downloaded the template from from Tripwire and applied it, and uh, we, we considered it at the time, wow, that's a, you know, that's, we, we could really, really, really um, watch everything on that box, and uh, I, I, you know, we maybe you could consider it a baseline. We didn't use the words at the time, um, but you know, if we do all of these checks, we must be secure, and that's uh, 
Uh, that's kind of how we approached it uh, earlier on in our uh, experience with Tripwire. Um, like I said, we're, we're getting to the point now where we can do a little more granularity, and Tripwire has the ability to, yes, you can watch all that stuff, and you can just kind of record it in the background uh, and provide reporting for you on the back end or some analysis if, if, if there's an incident later that you want to go back and see what changed, but take actual um, action uh, based on higher severity things that, uh, you know, like ports and services that, that you really want to know about right now when it happens. And uh, we kind of separate those two sets of rules into kind of a, a high criticality set and a low criticality set. And, uh, but regardless, record everything. So I think there's, a, there's real power there, and we're, we're looking forward to, to playing around with it. Thanks, Mark. And uh, we have quite a few questions coming in, so uh, unfortunately we won't have time for all of them, but we'll certainly follow up after the presentation um, on the ones that we don't get to. Um, one of the questions that um, uh, that I see out here is, is how many resources did you dedicate to getting Tripwire ready? Uh, so for us it was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, uh, that's a good question, and I, I actually get that quite a bit. Um, the, because it, it's really kind of hard, hard to answer for us specifically because we kind of grew organically. Uh, we, we really did start with a, a starter pack of Tripwire licenses and deployed it on uh, one and two and then three and then four servers um, and kind of grew over time as we got comfortable with the system. Uh, one of the things that um, I, I will suggest is that you, you spend some time um, not only configuring the tool and making sure your business requirements are met and that the and, and that things are uh, alerting on on only those things that you care about, um, but also spend some time working on uh, the business processes around uh, the data. You know, it's one of those things where you can turn it on and it, and it can give you all kinds of information. It could spam your inbox if you're not careful. Um, take spend some time uh, looking at your your response uh, apparatus for for GRE at the time. Uh, it was uh, it was fairly immature, and uh, we we've kind of learned the hard way to to make sure that you've got process around responding to what Tripwire tells you. It's a very powerful tool, and uh, your 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 systems aren't static as much as you'd like to think so. Uh, they will tell you when things change, and be ready for that. Uh, so to more specifically answer your question, how many resources does it take? Uh, we have one security engineer that put it in place and configured it. Uh, we did use two weeks of uh, Tripwire Professional Services to implement the whitelisting, and it's being managed by me um, going forward. And our uh, our operations center, which is a team of four people that respond to the alerts as they come through. So that's really the uh, the apparatus here that's that's managing Tripwire at GRE. Excellent, excellent. So uh, maybe one last question here, and like I said, we'll follow up uh, after the webcast on the other ones that we weren't able to get to. Um, so, Mark, how long, uh, once you implemented Tripwire, did it take you to, to feel audit ready? Um, yeah, good question. So we got the, uh, uh, our audit finding for SIP 7R2 is back in 2011. Uh, we, I believe within six months of that, we engaged uh, Tripwire Professional Services and came in for those two weeks to implement the, the whitelisting. And I would have to say that the moment the, that uh, that that gentleman left the door. We were audit ready. Um, it just uh, it, it kind of blew us away uh, the, the capabilities, and it was a combination of uh, pushing one button uh, to produce a report of all of our ports and services, um, as well as the dashboards from an operational management perspective that uh, that gave us that confidence to say that. Um, I will say that uh, tuning the whitelists and the port ranges uh, did take a, a, a bit of time. Uh, we found that our previous, uh, what do you call it, Robert, stare and compare process um, yeah. gave us um, all the initial data that we needed to build the whitelists, uh, but now we we're seeing as things changed how often things were changing that we just didn't have any insight into before, and we were able to, uh, to tune those ephemeral ranges down to actual numbers, uh, which, is, which is really the goal is to get it down to really good data. And uh, so that took a little bit of time to, to tune that down, but we felt that we were audit ready almost right away. Good question. Excellent, excellent. So um, just uh, because we're running out of time here, I think we'll have to wrap up. And again, I'll be following up with uh, the questions that we, we weren't able to answer on the webcast. Uh, but at this point, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Kate for a few closing items. And uh, I appreciate everybody's time and, and look forward to speaking with you in the future. 
Thank you so much, Robert. And I would like to thank you and um, our wonderful uh, customer presenter, Mark Child from Green River Energy. Thanks, Mark, for being on the line with us today. As I mentioned earlier, I'll be sending out a link to the on-demand version of this webcast and the slides. So you may also reply to that email if you'd like to earn a CPE credit for attending the webcast today. We hope you'll join us for future webcasts and events. Check out tripwire.com for everything that we have coming up, and also check out our blog, State of Security. Thank you, and have a great day.